very much. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, some challenges and uh, some opportunities. We like to think that every challenge has a, is also an opportunity. The challenges, one of the greatest challenges facing digital archaeology, uh, I believe, is that of, of preserving the digital data in the first place. Secondly, there is the challenge that there is now so much of it, as we've heard today, and it, there is the challenge of trying to join it up uh, to discover what digital resources are out there, and particularly when we try and integrate multiple data sets to make them interoperable so that we can indeed search across at, at European level. And thirdly, there are uh, political and <coughs> economic challenges, which are also opportunities, but we've heard that there, in general in, in Europe and beyond, in, indeed, there is a move towards open data. But all this does actually also provide quite some major opportunities um, to rethink the way we disseminate uh, archaeological information, not just from the point of view of putting data online, but also from linking from data to publications so that we can drill down from interpretation to raw data. And I want to say a little bit about that as well. Inevitably, my talk is going to be drawn largely on our experience in the UK uh, with ADS, which celebrates its uh, 20th birthday this year, as does our sister e-journal, Internet Archaeology. And lastly, I'm, as has already been uh, mentioned, I'm going to introduce uh, Ariadne, uh, a, a new European e-research infrastructure for archaeology. So I don't need to say much about preservation because Hella has all, already given an excellent introduction to this, but I just want to reinforce that digital data is fragile. Uh, far more fragile, really, than the data we excavate. Uh, but uh, many people still regard the archiving process as archiving as objects. We regard the, the physical disks as objects which we stick in boxes in museums, the same way we used to put pottery in boxes in, in museums. But it doesn't work <laughs> quite the same way. Heller showed how we should be doing it. Um, so I wanted to reinforce some of the of the problems that the. The published data is, are limited. Uh, we can get far more from the supporting underlying data. The majority of our data is only recorded in unpublished uh, fieldwork reports, the so-called grey literature. The data themselves are not easily accessible. Um, and just finding where uh, data is and being able to reuse it uh, is difficult too. <laughs> Sorry to put a, a photo of Cameron up, up there, but this is just to remind us of that political uh, context. Uh, the G8 uh, in 2013 put forward this open data uh, charter, um, and this stands for many European uh, proposals as well, in, in the United States as well, that the assumption should be that we get the data out there as open data. And it's worth just reminding ourselves of the five principles of that G8 Open Data Charter. That open data should be open by default. That should be the, the assumption. Rather than closing things up, it should be out there for everyone. We need to think about increasing the quality of that data and the quantity of it for, to allow us to answer some of the really exciting big data type questions that have already been mentioned in the last couple of days. It should be made available in a, in a format that is usable uh, by all, not just by the sort of elite uh, few. And that by doing this, we can uh, improve governance. We can, and in an archaeological and heritage management terms, I think that does in, include sort of citizen science and empowering uh, people, making them knowledgeable about the archaeology of their, their uh, region and country. And we can release data for, for innovation. Uh, my own university has just been awarded a, a, a £4 million pound grant to, to look at the use of, of a lot of data in heritage games, for example. Uh, and the sort of movie industry, games industry, could make a lot of use of, of stuff that we have. So ADS, as I mentioned, was, uh, it's 20 years old, was uh, set up in 1996. <coughs> it's based in the University of York, but provides at a, at a, at a national to UK level, a digital data archive for the UK, but we work closely with uh, England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, etc., and the national uh, services. Uh, we're now 15 staff. 
We're a self-sustaining archive. We receive no external uh, uh, grants. We have a business uh, model that is based upon a charging policy, whereas the data is free to use, but the polluter pays. The people who are creating the data uh, should be paying the cost of the preservation of it. Uh, Heller already mentioned the importance of accreditation. We have the data seal of approval. Mm -hmm. We were also awarded the Digital Preservation Coalition's uh, decennial, decennial Award in 2012 for the most outstanding contribution to digital preservation over the last decade. Um, the, co the quantity of data in terms of, of size may not seem, seem huge, 10 terabytes uh, in, in total. Um, but uh, most archaeological data sets today are not that large. A lot of the databases, texts, etc., do not take up massive amounts of space. What that represents, though, is over, as you can read there, over 2 million uh, files. And the key statistic there, this is just sort of pulled from our content management system last month, there have been over 18,505 recorded processes undertaken on those files to keep them usable. This is the sort of preservation mi by migration approach. So we've just, for example, gone through a major migration of all our CAD files, uh, which would no longer be usable if they'd been kept in the original format. So uh, that's our mission statement. <laughs> and it implies we do three things. We collect and preserve data sets, we provide easy and open access, but it's also incumbent upon us to provide guidance and support to data users. The guides to good practice have already been mentioned. These are, are now uh, internationally accepted guides in a number of countries. They're jointly published with our partners in the United States, Digital Antiquity, and they've been developed through Ariadne and other European projects as, as well with European case studies. And they're open access guides, wiki-based, and we're always looking for people to contribute further case studies to those guides from their own experience. So our website is the way into all of these uh, things. So I'll just, just sort of highlight a few collections that have just been released in the, in the last year. A major project undertaken at Reading University on Roman rural uh, settlement with a, a, a map-based search. Uh, this, is, this, this project involved a major data collection exercise from all the grey literature uh, in the, up and down the country, uh, funded partly by Historic England and partly by the Leverhulme uh, Trust, a unique sort of collaboration with, between a research council and a, and a national heritage uh, agency. Um, uh, we also have a lot of, sort of uh, journal type collections, not just covering the UK, so another recent release, Council of British Research in the Levant Monograph series. Um, this is a particularly interesting archive that, again, funded by what was English Heritage. Um, all the excavations undertaken in Ipswich from a period of 1974 to 1990, the digital data from all those uh, sites down to uh, uh, context plans and uh, site notebooks, etc., all, all scanned in, and um, allowing you to search by, by site, but also with a map-based search. Over the years, hundred hundreds and thousands of CAD plans produced now all integrated so that you can go down at polygon level uh, you can see the sort of query uh, at the bottom to search by particular types of features search by period I think this shows the potential eventually for starting to join up individual archives and search on a much larger scale using GIS uh, capabilities um, the unpublished fieldwork reports <laughs> are one of the uh, most used resources we host now, over 36,000 and, and um, a, a major important resource of, of things that were once locked away in cabinets in planning offices and are now open for everyone to, to use. Each one of those uh, published with a digital object identifier, a permanent uh, reference that uh, no matter if the report is moved to another server, one will always be able to cite and reference that report. An important part of the publication process and uh, accrediting the archaeologists who produce those, those reports. But we should also, as I mentioned, be thinking about more exciting ways to, to publish what we do, more exciting ways of getting it across to the public. Um, the beauty of digital data is that it provides sort of multiple forms of dissemination for multiple uh, audiences, each with their own needs. And alongside the ADS, now for 20 years, we've been publishing a peer-reviewed online e-journal, Internet Archaeology, uh, now in its 40th 
uh, issue. And uh, one of the most recent articles just uh, published a couple of, of weeks ago and got national press coverage and the BBC and all the broadsheets in the UK was this, uh, a paper about the discovery of the earliest known engraved uh, piece of jewellery in, uh, in England from the site at, at Stark R. Um, which is an academic, obviously, paper about, about the, uh, the, the pendant, but also includes some exciting bits of digital imagery, RTI uh, images of this pendant, which allow you uh, to use digital imaging uh, technology to actually look at the inscriptions, the engravings on this pendant in great detail. You can also download a 3D uh, uh, file so you can print your own uh, uh, pendant if you want on a 3D uh, uh, printer. But it's important that things like that are backed up by the raw data. So we also host the Starcar uh, archive, so you can go down from the, uh, the interpretive article to the underlying uh, data and, and research project that, that backed that up. And years ago, we had a, a, a project linking electronic archives and, and publications, the LEAP project, which was uh, awarded the, the British Archaeological Award for 2008, uh, Best Archaeological Innovation. Um, and this was really exploring new ways of linking between publications and, and archives. So here's a, uh, an example that Keith will be uh, fam familiar with, the, the ancient Mer of Turkmenistan project undertaken by uh, Tim Williams and a, and a large team uh, from UCL, with two ways into it. On the left, the, the ADS archive, on the right, the home page for the, the welcome page for the Internet Archaeology article. And so in the archive on the left are the raw uh, GIS files. In the publication on the right, there are the movies. And whereas one would, uh, in a printed publication, just have a still map, there you have a, a, an interactive way in to uh, query the, uh, the, the site GIS to look at uh, particular features. Uh, if you don't want to download all the raw data and open it up on your GIS desktop. Another thing that we've been looking at, and this is really coming from the sciences, is the idea of data papers. Just really encouraging people to publish their data sets with just a relatively short paper, <laughs> two or three, three pages, uh, which really highlights the value of the data set and its reuse uh, value. So, so here's one that was uh, published for an existing archive, Heathrow Terminal 5, that some of you may have had the misfortune of passing through on the way here. Um, but uh, the, the ADS archive for, uh, uh, for that, uh, and uh, the data paper, talking about, well, what can this data set be used for? What's its, its reuse potential? And included in all those, as part of the transparency process, is a referee statement, not by the, uh, the authors of the, of the paper, but an external uh, referee saying what they think of this, if, of this data set and how it can be used. And, well, are these, are, are these uh, archives used? This is one of the sort of commonest questions we're... Uh, we are asked. Uh, so there is a is an example, um, and you can see from when this was released in July 13 to January 16, it's had a series of, of, of downloads. So since release, about 500 individual downloads of, of data files from that uh, particular archive linked with that uh, DOI. And from a from a survey that was done, we can get a few more insights into who's using the data, what they're using it for. The largest slice of that pie, 42%, is education, uh, but commercial archaeological use, about 30%. National and local government archaeologists, another important uh, slice, 12%. But also in the UK, a lot of popular interest in archaeology, so 9% um, independent. And maybe a controversial uh, at sector of the pie, but 5% usage by uh, metal detectorists. Uh, metal detecting in the in the UK is is legal uh, as long as it's not on a protected site and, and people are encouraged to report their finds via the national scheme. So, sort of primary reuse of the data sort of reflects really those uh, proportions, but uh, sort of nineteen percent for private research, thirty eight percent for academic. Uh, research, teaching and learning, and uh, general interest. Note there the 1% the, the small proportion, but even for family history, you be aware of the popular interest in genealogy. Once you find out where, found out where your ancestors live, then a lot of people are interested in finding out, well, what was the environment? What was the, the history of the, of the place where they lived? Um, 
So this is a, a comparison between two sorts of data sets that we hold in, in, in ADS. On the left, uh, backgrounds of, of journals. And you can see the huge amounts of usage of, of, of those. Uh, the top one at the, one at the top, the green line at the top, Proceedings of Society of Antiquities of Scotland, generally about two to 3,000 downloads per month of papers from that, that journal. Uh, and sort of about halfway down the journal, Medieval Archaeology, and then one of our oldest collections, CBA Research Reports, along the bottom. But sort of compared with that, over a similar period, figures for a range of archives as, as well. Um, the vertical axis is, is different. If you can't read it, the, the one on the left is, goes up in the thousands, whereas the one on the right goes up in the tens. So much less use of, of, of the raw data in archives. But of course, that doesn't necessarily reflect the value that people are getting out of them. For every person reading a, a paper, the downloads of the data may be a researcher doing a new piece of research, which will lead to a complete reinterpretation and, and, and a new publication. But you can see one of the interesting things, of course, is that some of the Although there's often spikes, some of the archives that were released long ago are still being used. It's not that, that people download it immediately and then stop. The usage carries on through time. So it's an important point to make that collecting data from scratch is expensive. There's been a number of, of uh, research council funded projects in the, in the UK which have employed research assistants to go around HERs, uh, collecting data, photocopying grey literature reports, etc. Uh, Peter Fowler estimated that in his project he was only able to take out 5% of the information gained over the last uh, uh, 20 years. Richard Bradley spent three person years of an RA collecting data in order to write a synthesis on British and Irish prehistory. Uh, I employed an RA for, t uh, for two years collecting data for a project on, on uh, Viking and Anglo-Saxon landscapes. And the Roman Rural Settlement Project that I mentioned uh, that's just been released, six-person years of data collection to, uh, uh, paid for to gather that uh, data. So, yeah, sure. So data preservation does have a cost too, um, uh, but it's worth it, surely, rather than having to sort of recollect all, the, all this data. We have a, uh, I mentioned our charging policy, we have a costing tool on our website so that you can put up the number of files that you're interested in, the um, uh, types of those files, and it will give you openly transparent what it will cost. So it's a level playing field for the various contractors who might want to use ADS. They will all get the same uh, price that they can include in the uh, project specification. And a number of surveys have shown the sort of value of, of this data. So this is one done by the, the GISC on the, uh, the use and value and impact of data centres. Um, and the, the figures for archaeology were, were uh, does this compare it with a range of other disciplines, were very high. So 84% of respondents there thought that the ADS had had an impact on the culture of data sharing uh, within the, the discipline. 79%, it reduced the time needed for data access and processing. Over half, 51%, thought they brought new intellectual opportunities. 56%, again, permitted new types of research. And 94% of respondents felt that data was either very or quite important for their research. We could also make the economic case for this. As an independent study was done by uh, an economist, uh, John Houghton, alongside with the digital preservation specialist, Neil Beagrey. They estimated the total sort of investment value in ADS was, was about, per annum was about 1.2 million. Of that, uh, 700,000 was funding that came from um, sponsors, whereas uh, 465,000 was the money that the people creating the data, what it was costing them to deposit the data with us. But the direct use value of that data, fortunately, was higher than that, was 1.4 million per annum. But that doesn't really sum it all up, because the, the, as you see, read there, the efficiency impacts they estimated ranged between 13 million and 58 million per, per annum, with a research, research efficiency gain of seven hours per person per week saved uh, by the archiving of data. And in terms of cost value, for every one pound invested in digital archiving, providing a return of eight pounds thirty. 
uh, so at, over a period of, of 30 years. So we can make the economic justification to, to politicians. <coughs> Lastly, in the time remaining, it's important I say something about the European uh, dimension of this as, as well. Um, we've already mentioned the importance of e-infrastructures and doing this at, at a European level and looking at interop interoperability. We can get data out there it needs to be preserved once, but it needs to appear in multiple shop windows at national level, at regional level, but also at European level. Many of the research questions we're asking are European-wide research questions. Modern political boundaries have no relevance for the Bronze Age. So Ariadne, has been mentioned many times, has been working on this. It was uh, mentioned in the uh, new estuary roadmap. Uh, it was published last week, in, uh, launched last week in, in Amsterdam as one of the ways to go forward for heritage science in Europe. Uh, a range of partners, uh, you can go to the website and read about all well, they are, many of them are represented here. Um, and in a couple of weeks' time, we will be launching the Ariadne portal. Peter mentioned the importance of, of trying to join these things up, uh, across Europe. This portal has been done by the DAI and our colleagues in Sweden at the SNDS. And it basically facilitates a, a, a where, what, what, when type search. So there's a sort of uh, a preview of the sort of where type search. We're sort of gradually loading data from more partners. So that heat map at the moment is very UK heavy because it's got about 1.3 million records from the UK in it. But this is a way of joining up uh, national uh, uh, boundaries. Uh, if we drill down, you can get more detail there, but you can drill down obviously to individual records with the sort of timeline and once you've pulled up the, the metadata for these individual records, uh, you can then go to a specific site. It will give you geographically similar sites, thematically similar uh, uh, sites, a summary of it. And with a link access the resource on the web, uh, you can go to, then down to the uh, archive, in this case, number one poultry uh, held by ADS. But records from many of our partners are going to be on there in the same way, and you can go down to them. We've collaborated uh, with a number of organisations in order to make this possible uh, because obviously we're joining up uh, data that's recorded according to different periods, schematics, different uh, uh, terminologies. Period O, uh, developed in the United States, is, is producing authority lists for periods so that we can map everyone's period terms onto an absolute date scale. So we've published in period O the Ariadne data collection drawn from all our partners of their period definitions. Um, work by our Greek partners as also, and our colleagues at the University of South Wales has also done mappings from native subjects to a common spine using the Getty AAT thesaurus so that we've mapped all the terminologies from all the partner data sets there so you can search on a particular uh, term. So, to, uh, uh, to wrap up and just draw some conclusions uh, from this, digital data preservation does have a cost, but of course collecting it and losing it is much more expensive, and it is reused. We've demonstrated that people are using it, and it has a research return and economic return. It is possible, we've demonstrated that over the last 30 years, that you can develop sustainable business models for digital archiving that don't require uh, state funding or as, as grant in aid. It allows us to think creatively about new models for publication and dissemination, but we d it emphasises we do need to work at European mm. level. The data standards we're underpinning Ariadne is fundamental to allowing these cross searches. We have to accept that aggregation and the mappings of local terms involves some information loss, but it also facilitates us to answer uh, some really big data challenges. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Julie.